Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox and Sam Silverstein back for this month's webinar on the culture audit. Today, we're going to take a deep dive into assessing culture, what the culture audit assesses, and then how you can use those. Sam, welcome back. Hey, Tom, it's great to be here and to continue our conversation on culture. And I'm excited for those people who've joined us in the past, joining us maybe for the first time today. I love the questions that they've been submitting and the conversations we've been having. Sam, uh, we have talked about the 16 different areas of assessment the culture audit makes. And today I really wanted to take a deep dive into each of those and why you think it's so important to assess those areas. So let's just go down the list. All right. And the one thing with a list, I just want to make sure I don't want to prioritize one area over another. So because it's at the top or at the bottom doesn't mean it's any more important or less important. It's just a list. I, I feel that all of these areas are critical. If we're going to build a type of organization that attracts and retains the best people and that ultimately is going to perform the best on the bottom line and serve its stakeholders at the highest level. So we measure ethics. The first thing, is this a culture of ethics? Is, is ethics high in this culture? Is it strong? Obviously, that's important to know. And according to the Department of Justice, they want us to do that, right? Absolutely. And uh, they want to know not just are you an ethical organization, but their question is, what evidence do you have? How can you show that? How do you know that? How do you, from your vantage point as Mr. or Ms. CEO, how can you even begin to say you have an ethical organization? We want to see the data. And it struck me the first time I saw the culture audit, that first ethical component answers that most basic question that a regulator sitting across the table from you is going to ask. Exactly. And that's why it's so critical to be there. We need to know. And as leaders, we think many times, oh, yeah, every, it's, we're very ethical. You might be ethical, but that doesn't mean that you as an organization or where you can or could be. But we measure that. And when we measure that, we know. And then it's really simple. It's not about pointing fingers. It's about being our very best. And we can find out where we may or may not need to, to improve. So ethics is one of those areas. The next thing we look at is the establishment of the organizational beliefs and values. Are the values well established within the organization? Do people know what they are? Are they living them? Are they being stepped out? Because this in essence is going to define what your culture is. So we find that it's just really critically important to deep dive on the organizational beliefs and values. The organizations that are a little weaker in that area, their culture is usually a little weaker. It's a little softer. It's not as clear or well-defined. Sam, as for my sins, I'm a lawyer. And a lawyer would say, sure, where are your policies and procedures? That tells you your values. Why is that wrong? Because policies and procedures are important, but those aren't values. So I get three sick days or I get two weeks vacation or that, those are policies and procedures. Those aren't values. Values are what you believe. And a set of an organization needs a great set of values if they want to have a great culture. Now, they don't just need great values. They need a great set. And the reason we delineate is because a great set focuses on four specific areas or connects to four areas. So the set of values in its totality must connect to all four to be a great set and must be established in the organization, which means everyone must live them. Not 20% of the people, 30%, 40%. This needs to be lived throughout the organization. And so when the leader understands that there's a difference between policies and values, policies are about things, values are about people. They define the rules of the sandbox. How do we treat people? How do we communicate? What is excellence? How do we participate in the community? These are important areas that when we define them, people will act in alignment with those values. And that's when you get a great culture. What's up after a value, Sam? Okay, then we want to look at focus. Now, focus for us is this. What do your people focus on? And your people are trained to focus or not to focus on certain areas. So, for instance, if a salesperson says, yes, yeah, sales are down, the economy's soft, that means they're focused on something they can't control because I've never met a sales professional that could control the economy. What can they control? They can control the number of calls they make. They can control the number of 
time, the amount of time they put in front of clients. They can control their presentation. There's so many things that are in their control. And whatever your position is in the organization, when you focus on what you cannot control, you get bogged down, fear comes up, nothing happens. When you focus on what you can control, you make decisions, you move forward. Is the workforce trained to focus on those things that they can control? That's something we want to know. Next up is clarity of mission. And I think this one's pretty obvious. If we don't know the mission and we don't know how our area of responsibility attaches to the mission, then it's impossible to achieve the mission. The mission needs to have crystal clarity throughout the organization. We want to know if that's the case. And so we ask that. Sam, how do you prevent mission creep? Man, that's one of the biggest challenges in life, isn't it? We start off with this and it grows and grows. I, mission creep is managed by having crystal clarity about what the mission really is and then being taught to ask the question, does this align with our mission? Is it outside of our mission? And most of the bad decisions I've made is when I've taken on projects that really didn't align with or support the mission. That doesn't mean that everything we take on is going to work, but at least we need to ask that question. And we can't ask the question unless we have crystal clarity around what our mission is. Next up is whether or not people feel valued. Do people feel valued in the organization? And this is critical because people that feel valued participate and respond differently. When people feel valued, they know they have a voice, they know that they're heard, and they're willing to share their opinions, their insights, their experiences. When people aren't talking inside of an organization, then you get siloed information, which is the number one problem we see in most organizations. And this happens because people simply don't feel valued. Is it okay to make a mistake? Is it, um, does it matter where you went to school? Uh, does it matter how you look? When those things start matter, start counting, then people many times don't feel valued as human beings. What's up next? From there, we go to making quality decisions. We want to know if the decisions being made within the organization are of quality, because we believe that when you the higher degree of quality in your decisions, the better the results. It only makes sense. And most people have no idea what, the, well, how do you know if it's a quality decision or not? It's real simple. If we've created a, a well-defined set of values, are the decisions aligning with the values? That's going to determine the quality of the decision. If decisions don't align with the values, then it's not a quality decision. And so we want to measure that. And then we also want to measure employee engagement, Tom, because employee engagement is critical. Engaged employees perform at a level that employees that aren't engaged don't perform at. It's that simple. And this is a binary equation. You're either engaged or you're not. You can't be somewhat engaged, partially engaged. If you're engaged or you're not, I don't know how else to put that. And so we measure that. We want to know that people are engaged because engaged people are engaged for a reason. They enjoy what they're doing. They feel valued. They feel like they're making a difference. And those are the people that are going to recommend working here to their friends and family who are also quality individuals. Because you know what? If you have a great workplace culture, if I'm a part of that culture, I'm not going to recommend working here to somebody who's not going to work, who someone's going to goof off or try and take advantage of the system or doesn't align with our values. I had a client once said, yeah, we have highly engaged employees, but the problem is they don't recommend working here to their friends and family. And I'm like, I question whether or not you have highly engaged employees. I think we need to check that out. Anyway, so we look at employee engagement. The next thing we measure time is accountability. We have the ability to measure accountability within the organization. Accountability is keeping your commitments to people you're responsible for things. You're accountable to people. There's a difference between responsibility and accountability. Your job description is a list of responsibilities, but accountability is between you and me as human beings. Accountability is something that leadership takes on and models. And when, they, when leadership models being accountable to and for their people, then their people will be inspired to take that on. So when we say accountability is keeping your commitments to people, it's about the relational commitments, not the tactical ones. 
keeping your tactical commitments is the price of admission. Sam, does the culture audit met the measure the perception of employees of the accountability of senior management, or is it only measuring those who feel like they're accountable? The cultural audit measures the present presence of accountability inside the organization. And since we talk to everyone in the organization, it's an organizational wide view. The, if you go into the micro, since accountability comes from leadership, that's where it emanates and it lives in the culture. It's going to give a measurement of the accountability. Does leadership recognize and live, step out? It's accountability to and for the people. Ultimately, that's what we're going to find out. What's up after accountability, Sam? And then we start looking at speed of implementation. Because what we know is that a good idea, a good decision made today is better than a good decision or more valuable than a good decision made tomorrow because you have the opportunity to reap the benefits of that decision. So organizations come up with ideas all the time. The ones that can implement them quicker and get to the desired result are going to outperform the ones that take longer time to implement. So we look at speed of implementation inside of an organization. And we also look at trust because trust is right at the core. Our working relationship is different if trust is in place than if it isn't. When trust isn't in place, I'm always looking over my shoulder. I feel like I go into a meeting, I got to keep information that no one else knows because someone might come after me and I need this information to look good, rather than sharing the information with the people that need it so they can make educated decisions. So trust is really critical. Trust is at, is at the foundation of high-performance organizations. Trust is also going to impact speed of implementation, because if I'm always worried about every time you make a decision, if you're out to get me or not, then I'm not implementing. When trust is in place, speed of imp implementation also accelerates. Let me, let me ask you a few more questions about trust, because that's one of the areas that compliance professionals focus on, and they do it for the following reason. They feel like if there's trust, then they'll have a better culture of speak up, not just a hotline, not just a number someone could call and report anonymously, but a true culture of speak up where an employee will trust that if they raise their hand and say something, it will be listened to. It doesn't mean that they'll get the answer they want. It doesn't mean they'll get the result they want, but they'll be listened to. They may be counseled. They may be brought in for further discussions, but there'll be a process that employees uh, can see relatively transparently that they'll feel like they're a part of. Do the questions from the culture audit really move towards those areas? Absolutely. And, and one of the areas, let me add something to that, Tom, because you really nailed that. That's exactly right. Um, one of the areas we measure is safety. And I'm not talking about physical safety, but emotional safety. And so when you look at our people, do they feel valued? Do they feel safe? Is trust present? These micro areas all add up to creating that culture where the ethical standard is high because people are going to step forward. When people feel safe to speak up, when they know that they're heard, when they trust the people around them to take information and do what's right with it, then you're going to have that, that, that culture of speak up where people are going to share what's going on because they know that leadership truly wants to know. It's not about punishing someone when something goes wrong. It's about fixing it and making it better, making it safe, making it integral for everyone in the organization. What's up after trust, Sam? Communication. What's the quality of communication? A lot of organizations struggle with communication. Are we texting each other? Are we emailing each other? Or, or are we having face-to-face -face communication? Are we having phone calls? There's all different levels of communication and quality of communication. Do we know how to communicate? Do we know what the information is that the people we communicate with need? So we look at the quality of communication within an organization because we know when there's high quality of communication and people feel valued and they trust each other, then what happens is teamwork is going to abound. You cannot have great teamwork without great communication. So it's important to measure communication. Is this communication that is simply down, top down, or is it communication literally both up and down the chain of an organization? It's 360. What's the, do we, 
how do you and I communicate with each other? How does my senior communicate with me? How do I, com- how does my junior feel like I'm communicating with them? And it really does look at a 360 as far as communication goes. What's up after communication, Sam? We talked about safety. And so do people feel emotionally safe? And that's what, that's the next area. And after that, we look at the strength of leadership. What's the strength of leadership throughout the organization? Everything rises and falls on leadership. And it's important that the people in the organization, it's important to have strong leadership and that the people understand that they have good leadership. And when they do and they buy in, then that makes a difference in how they act and how they respond in all situations. Emily, let me pick up on a phrase you used, which was leadership throughout the organization. When I think of leadership, I think of simply the very top of the organization. But it it seemed to me you implied something different when you said leadership throughout the organization. Could you expand on that? The first time we met face-to-face was at a conference. And at this conference, I was speaking at 1 o'clock in the afternoon after lunch. And I walked into the room at about 10 o'clock in the morning, and there was a panel on the, on the stage having a panel conversation. And one of the gentlemen on there said, the problem is never at senior leadership. The problem is always at middle level. We have the PR department to tell us what to say and do, but they don't. And in my program, I very kindly stated that in an organization, if there's a culture problem, if there's a there's an accountability problem. If there's an ethics problem, the problem is always at senior leadership. It's not at the mid-level because senior leadership is responsible for hiring everyone in the organization. Because if I, if you're the senior and I report to you and I hire someone and that person's causing problems and you don't know about it, then you haven't set up the right communication. You're not observing. You're not getting feedback. You're not saying we can't have people stay in this organization that are making these kinds of decisions. And so great leadership starts at the top, but there should be great leadership at all levels in the organization because it's modeled so strongly at the top and it's and it is and is communicated that around here, this is how we lead, this is how we communicate, these are the values of the organization. No matter who you are, no matter what your title is, no matter what your last name is, no matter who you're related to. And when you do that in an organization and you develop this strong leadership, you have great leadership up and down the organizational chart. There's no reason why you can't have that. What's up after leadership, Sam? Okay, the last two areas. One is stress. What kind of stress exists in the workplace? Stress is a big deal, and it, it hampers performance. It's unhealthy. It drives employees away. And so it's important to know a couple of things. One. Is stress inherent in this job? Because there are some jobs in some industries where stress is inherent. If you're running emergency services, if you're in a fire, if you're in a fire department and you're going out to a burning building, there's a certain amount of inherent stress. But then there's also stress that people create. And then no matter where the stress comes from, as leaders, what are we doing to mitigate that stress? What programs and things do we have in place to help our people deal with that stress and to lower that stress as a concerned leader? So we want to know what's going on from a stress team. And finally, but and again, least. this list, but definitely not least, we measure diversity, equity, and inclusion because you want an organization that has All of that. We need diverse people. We need a diverse way of thinking. We need diverse opinions. We need to have equity. We need people to feel included. We want an organization where all feel welcome. And the only real requirement is these are our values. This is our culture. If you work here, we're going to live this culture. Sam, the reason I wanted to go through this list in some detail is that in your view, or at least the view I've heard you say over the the years we've known each other, culture is not one thing. It is a multitude of things, and they all interact together. And so by having this broad-based, really comprehensive assessment, does this, in your opinion, allow an organization, a leader, a board of directors even, to determine where there may be deficiencies and where 
remediation can be brought to bear to improve some of these myriad sub areas. Tom, my mother always said, Sam, don't answer a question with a question. But every now and then, I may have done something she didn't ask me to do. So I'm going to ask you a question. What happens if you're the CEO of an organization, regardless of size, whether you have 250 employees or 250,000 employees? And when you can have the information at your fingertips to where you know inside your organization, how is ethics showing up or not showing up? How are the organizational beliefs and values established within the organization? What are your people focusing on? Do they have clarity of mission? Do your people feel valued? Are they making quality decisions? Are your employees engaged? Are they accountable? Is speed of implementation something that you are leveraging? Is there a high degree of trust? Do you have quality communication? Is innovation and change something that's present in your workforce? Do people feel safe? Do you have good leadership throughout the organization? Are you doing things to, to reduce stress for your people because you care about them? And have you created a diverse workplace that, that is equitable and inclusive? What do you think that positions you as a leader to do? It positions you as a leader to understand, manage, oversee or monitor the management strategy you put in place and then improve based upon the data that comes to you from the overall monitoring. So I would, if I was the leader, I would say it gives me the ability to <clears throat> improve areas that are going to increase engagement, increase employee satisfaction, hit the bottom line with both efficiency and greater ROI. Absolutely. A leader that doesn't have this information is almost negligent. I don't know how you would lead. And not at once, but if you work on improving these areas and you improve all of these areas or a lot of these areas, think about the impact that has on the bottom line. Because as people make better decisions, they move faster, they trust each other, they communicate better, they work better as teams, they're more engaged. How can you not up your performance and your productivity? And when productivity goes up, profitability goes up. And what's even better than all of that is you become known for this. You become known in your community. And your community could be P. Rote, Alabama, a small little town. Your community could be a global basis because you're a multinational company doing business around the world. But when you become known for this, People want your products. They want your services. They want to be associated. They want to be a supplier. They want to be a customer. They want to be an employee. What a great place to be as a leader of an organization. Sam, unfortunately, we are near the end of our time for today's webinar. We are going to link to the culture audit in our show notes, and we're also going to have a scheduling app. If our listeners would like to engage more with Sam or Tom or perhaps both of us, Sam, I greatly look forward to our next webinar together. Thank you, Tom. It's always a pleasure having this conversation. And anyone um, that's listening or watching, submit your questions. Let us know what's on your mind so we can get you specific answers to specific issues.